Good afternoon. I hope you feel refreshed after the lunch break. It's been proven in the commercial sector that properly implemented cloud technology can improve speed of delivery, increase security and create opportunities for organisations. Government organisations need to adopt a similar approach and work together more effectively to take full advantages of the benefits cloud can offer. The buy once, use multiple times approach can provide cost savings whilst embracing cloud solutions. For example, a joint technical and commercial approach to cost optimization reduced a home office portfolio's cloud spend by 40% by using a variety of optimization techniques across storage, use and resource. In June last year, fastest CDN outage brought down some of the world's largest websites from the BBC, the New York Times, CNN and Gov.uk. It raised concerns around single solution providers and relying on a handful of companies to run the vast infrastructure which underpins some of the biggest real estate on the internet. How does the public sector transition from legacy to cloud? What are the challenges and benefits of cloud and which environment, public, private, hybrid or multi-cloud is best for the public sector? In this panel discussion, hear how organisations have embraced cloud adoption to enable accelerated growth in digital transformation, and perhaps we'll gain an insight into lessons learned. Our panellists are Russell MacDonald, Chief Technology Officer for the Public Sector at Hewlett Packard Enterprise, Rhiannon Lawson, Director of Digital for the Tony Blair Institute, and Alex Hilton, Chief Executive of the Cloud Industry Forum. Do submit questions. Ask Russell, Rhiannon or Alex anything, you'll find the uh, question button at the bottom of your screen. So uh, welcome to everybody. We've got everybody here to start off our fourth panel discussion of the day. Russell, the cloud first policy was introduced in 2013. Why is it still a talking point almost a decade later and surely isn't everybody on the cloud already? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, hello, Helen. Thanks for having me today. Um, I think, um, you know, the, there was an aspiration that, that government should follow the lead of, uh, of the commercial sector in moving to cloud. And, and, you know, there was that kind of cost element to it, the idea that it would save government vast amounts of money. I think the policy said cloud is the destination. It didn't really give any guidance to departments or organizations on how to get there. Um, and it didn't really focus on modernization. Um, and so what we've seen is that with uh, gov.uk, we've got lots of new digital services have launched on public cloud, which is, you know, appropriate place to put those sort of citizen facing services. Um, but we still have a long tail of legacy technology that's actually powering the back office for many government organizations. And it's taking time um, to, to modernize those workloads. Let's bring Rhiannon in there, because Rhiannon, you led on the cloud first policy for government. So I was going to ask how it's going, but also to respond to what cloud was the destination, but perhaps there wasn't enough guidance to, to actually get there. That's exactly right. So um, when I was in uh, the government, I did I led on the newest form of the of the cloud first policy so the cloud policy for uh, the cloud first policy was absolutely not going to change we did lots and lots of research uh, to establish whether it was still needed um, and the answer from all government departments was absolutely this is a really key policy for us um, but what we don't have is the is the guidance to be able to get us there. Um, in 2013, I think it was, as uh, Russell said, absolutely an aspiration. Um, and that, but departments didn't necessarily know how to tackle it fully. Um, so we went and spoke to a lot of departments, and they said we have problems with how how do we manage lock in, how do we manage concentration risk, how do we pick a, a cloud strategy, when do we know whether we should use a multi-cloud, hybrid cloud, single cloud solution, and how do we do all of that? Um, and the problem often comes that, um, that that senior leadership don't actually know a lot of the answers to those things. They don't know how to tackle it. And that means they get sort of told something by one person and then they go down that route without really understanding it. So what we did was create a whole new raft of um, guidance and and case studies was a big thing as well, uh, all of which can be found on the cloud guide for the public sector on Gov.uk. Um, and, and that was our next step in how to make uh, the cloud first policy work for uh, the public sector. 
local get government you to- is a whole nother situation. And as, <laughs> as Russell said, there's a long tail and there's a lot of work to be done, uh, but they are working so hard. There is a lot to be done, isn't there, Alex? And, um, you know, we've spoken before. Are you surprised that at this stage that everybody isn't isn't using cloud? Uh, well, they are. Well, they <laughs> to are. Some, to okay. some degree, or, to some some degree or other. Okay. Um, and, you know, you just put, it, put us all in our consumer lives. We are yeah. Uh, yeah. in many, many ways, whether we often realise it or in fact not. Obviously, in a business environment, there are far more moving parts, far more complexity, and, and a great deal of, if you like, legacy uh, that already exists in there, the technology that's, you know, 30 years ago, I worked for ICL selling mainframes into the public sector. Um, some of them may still exist. Um, but the point being, where we've now got to in this, Helen, is and we conduct research at the Cloud Industry Forum to look at really what's happening uh, in the markets, not just public sector, across enterprise organizations, and indeed down to small businesses as well. And actually, what our research tells us is that 94% of organizations are using cloud at some level or other. It might have been, you know, as Rhiannon and Russell are kind of implying there, organizations have just kind of fallen into it uh, rather than by design. And I think the how has got to be a big, important part if we're really going to move on to the next step, have that um, paradigm shift. I don't like the phrase, but uh, you, you get the principle. It kind of paints the picture around that one. Um, most organizations are now receptive to the language that we call digital transformation. Uh, so they recognize there is a need to, to you know, have that, if you like, seismic shift in terms of the needs of the business and therefore really thinking about what technology can do to help that drive and, and make that shift. Uh, and, and there are challenges in there. You know, it doesn't have to be boiling the ocean, which is what a lot of organizations will perhaps think we've got to reset, start again, get rid of everything. It doesn't have to be that. You know, it can be a much more of a piecemeal type of approach and taken in stages uh, a, a, along the way. Um, you know, as an example, it might just be starting with infrastructure. Okay, so you know, taking those uh, those 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 servers, the data centers, to a degree, and outsourcing components of that into cloud-based services, and that's a simpler way of getting in uh, to, to that space as well. Organizations are thinking much more slightly off topic here, but much more about sustainability, particularly in the public sector mm-hmm. as well. You know, and there's a whole argument again. Actually, says, well, look, cloud-based services are better for the environment uh, from a sustainability perspective rather than lots of organizations running their own data centers. Let's have centralized uh, capability that will be more effective in there. Uh, There's this balance between public cloud and private cloud and on-premise that we call hybrid. Uh, So, you know, the mixed environment, which ultimately, and I'm sure Russell will talk about this one quite extensively because we've done a bit of it before ourselves, is absolutely the direction of travel uh, that I think most organizations will find them in. So there are challenges, but there's also a lot of opportunity there that can really help organizations move. Uh, forwards. What are the opportunities, Russell, and what direction, picking up from what Alex said there, should public bodies be going in? Yeah, I think, you know, Alex is right. So I think, you know, almost everybody has some kind of footprint in cloud today. I think the point I'm making is that um, there's been a lot of historical investment in systems which are on, on, on-prem on legacy technologies, um, but IT hasn't stood still. So you know, IT has continued to evolve. We've we've learned from the uh, from the growth of cloud, and now um, you know companies like HP are kind of bringing those cloud capabilities to to that technology, um, so that you know we're providing customers more choice. And so to address that kind of legacy challenge, being able to modernize some of those workloads in place using the latest in technology, which is, you know, all about automation, software definition, um, you know, ease of use and pay for what you use can can actually help customers in the public sector achieve the benefits without kind of just focusing on let's try and lift and shift everything to a different place and hope for a different result. Um, So I think, you know, we do need to be kind of really focused now on the modernization agenda. You know, let's do these things for the right reasons. Let's put the right workloads in the right place for the right reason um, and make sure that we are kind of modernizing our estate from, you know, edge to cloud um, and taking a more holistic view of, of IT so that that ultimately will improve services for citizens because we're updating the back office as well as the front office services. And also, as we always say, the public are at the heart of the public sector, so it has to be an improvement for citizens. But Russell, what is multi-cloud and why should public bodies be considering multi-cloud? 
Yeah, so I think, as we say, you know, almost everybody's got a footprint in cloud of some mm. form. Um, you know, cloud first as a policy has been around since 2013. So there were some early movers, and maybe they put some some of their Gov UK services into, you know, one of the cloud providers at that time. Um, subsequently, they may have adopted things like Microsoft 365. Um, and so now they're multi-cloud because they're using services from more than one public cloud provider. Um, but I think over time now, we're seeing that, you know, the rise of more software as a service products in government, um, more government specific or, or public sector specific software vendors are now providing their products as a service. Um, and as I say, um, you know, companies like HPE now completely pivoting our business to provide everything as a service um, to our customers. So there's a, there's a broad range now of, of cloud-like services that can be consumed. Um, and that's great for customer choice. Um, I think, you know, there are some considerations, there are some complications. You know, we talk about the, the complexities of cost optimization. There's the challenges associated with the skills gap, which you had the session on earlier today. And obviously the more different technology you use, the more that that gets amplified. And the fact that, um, you know, public cloud providers, they are proprietary platforms. So although they provide ultimately the same sort of services, they all do it in a slightly different way. So if you've got people who are certified in one cloud platform, that doesn't mean they will necessarily be able to get the most out of another cloud platform and they may have to learn some stuff all over again. So I think, you know, customers need to be quite conscious and circumspect about which cloud services they use for the right reasons for their business and for the services that they want to provide to their customers and citizens. Rhiannon, can you give us some insight, perhaps from your time in Wales, in government in Wales, how you choose a cloud and is it ever suitable not to be in the cloud? Yeah, so I think um, the, so how you choose a cloud, how you choose a cloud, but how you hmm. choose a cloud strategy, I think is, yeah. is, um, is a thing that a lot of organisations get wrong. So um, a lot of organizations will start with, we need to be multi-cloud, but they don't really understand why. And just to, just to tack on to Russell's answer on what multi-cloud is, one of the things that public se sector organizations often get mixed up is there's like multi-cloud organizationally, and then there's multi-cloud within a single service. And uh, I'm not going to say which organization it was, but there was an organization that tried to create a service across two different cloud providers for a variety of reasons. And it got halfway down the line and they realized it was just too hard. And they had some really amazing people, but they didn't have the skills. They, the security was hard. The patching was difficult. The updates didn't happen at the same time. And they realized that that wasn't possible. Um, but they were organizationally multi-cloud. They used more than one cloud service. So just I just wanted to tack that on. But how you choose a how you choose a cloud strategy is you need to look at your um, your current estate, look at what the organizational and business goals are, look at what your security and risk appetite are, what's your budget, what's a, what's your commercial approach, and if you've got any sort of regulatory uh, regulatory requirements or anything like that, and then on top of that, look at your skills. So Russell just mentioned who. who what what are your developers capable of? Who are they certified with? It is pointless having uh, have, saying, "Well, we want to move to one cloud." When all of your all of your developers are, they're all certified in AWS, so it makes it really difficult. So there's lots of things you need to consider. But then after that, look at what your problems are and what do you actually need. Um, you might not need to use more than one cloud because actually you don't need to worry about um, cloud concentration risk, which is where you've got everything in one place. So if, if there's a failure um, and, and that information in, in there is critical, then you might have a problem. So if, if you don't, have, if you're not worried about downtime, then you might not need multiple clouds. Um, if you're not worried about um, if you don't have legislative requirements, then you might not need to worry about putting things in different places. Um, but the other thing is, is that, uh, you, you know, you need to consider your legacy technology. And as Russell mentioned, the lift and shift, you can't, you shouldn't be just lifting and shifting from one cloud to, uh, from on-prem to the cloud. You need to look at all of that and go, what we need to get rid of. 
Uh, to answer your second question, um, when it comes to when is it suitable to not be in the cloud, um, there are plenty of reasons, um, including uh, that you've got incredibly high risk data, um, and that is uh, it is very rare that you've got incredibly high risk data. Some of the organisations you'd expect to have high risk data who want to be keep everything on prem and locked in a box. Um, they use the cloud so um there's there's very few situations where that is the case but there are some um if again back to um legal requirements if there is a legal requirement that you have to host your data in a certain way well then that's the case um or if it security risks um it's it's those three things really um uh, i think are perfectly good reasons to say let's not put it in the cloud and that's fine. And that is part of your cloud strategy is not using the cloud. Um, and that's that's a reasonable thing to include in your strategy. Alex, do you want to build on what Rhiannon and Russell were saying and also talk about the, the greatest challenges that organizations are currently facing on this front? Yeah, yeah, yeah very happy to. Um, I, I suppose my caveat around that, I think it's some really great advice that Rhiannon gave in there as well. I should emphasize that. Uh, you know, it's great to have some of the practical components of actually what needs to be done here and the considerations that need to be taken or made. Um, I think as far as complexity is concerned, and I guess my balance around this one is we can very easily get into this sort of negative spiral of all the horrible, horrible things that can happen in there. But you know what? We can go back over decades in public sector projects and know there have been challenges and frankly failures uh, that, that have occurred at, at all ends uh, of the spectrum within the public sector, not just public sector and enterprise organizations as well. I think to answer your question directly, Helen, um, some of the challenges that we see I think as we certainly get into the cloud space more and more now in public sector, who are lagging probably slightly behind some of the commercial enterprise organizations in terms of the cloud adoption as well, uh, it's just one of complexity. And, and you might be surprised to hear me saying this running a, a trade body called the Cloud Industry Forum, but it should not necessarily be cloud for the sake of cloud. Uh, you know, I wholly agree with that. There are going to be examples and scenarios and workloads that are just maybe not appropriate uh, for cloud, as Rhiannon uh, implied. Complexity, though, is a big one. You know, actually, in truth, cloud services have brought complexity to organizations where they're managing kind of multiple workloads and multiple in IT environments. Uh, and that's where this, you know, hybrid cloud uh, kind of component comes into play because you need multiple skills around that one. But there are real benefits that come out of the back of that as well. You know, and again, looking at our research, some 96% of organizations we surveyed said they believe cloud services are now saving them money. Uh, to some level or other. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't necessarily the case. You know, I started talking about cloud some 10, 15 years ago. Um, I, I was saying the last reason you want to move to any cloud-based services is for cost savings, because uh, it's not necessarily going to be this. But you've got to watch that cost. You've got to manage that cost. There's a complexity in there, and the cost can spiral. And, you know, we have seen examples of that. You know, you start with what seems like a little uh, credit card transaction that all of a sudden becomes something much, much bigger. So organizations have got to manage that. Um, but they, they've, they've got to, you know, consider that quite carefully. They've got to consider the legacy components in there. You don't need to change. You know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it adage really works here um, if, you, if you don't need to change it don't um, if you're really trying to you know and I put approaches with my commercial hat on here that says well you know most organizations will be looking for this digital transformation because they want to improve their services in some way in the commercial enterprise environment where you have bottom lines and profit targets and things of this nature it's really uh, about you know how do I fundamentals of business how do I increase my revenue or how do I cut, cut my costs uh, you know any, every business will have those challenges in the public sector the cost cutting component particularly in the environment you know financially globally we find ourselves in is going to be even more relevant so cloud can help in those spaces but it needs to be done in, in a controlled managed fashion um, I think you know we, we've referenced it already I think the skills challenges in the market not just in the public sector in every sector are issues at the moment um, the, the number one barrier that we found to cloud adoption through our research has always been security um, and that's actually diminishing uh, so the security component, and I think Rihanna implied this as well, saying well, a lot of organizations that deal in this space actually are using cloud services to some degree uh, or other. Cloud services can be very secure. Uh, you know, you've got to make sure you've got the right um, belt and braces kind of approach around that one to, to, for it to be so. But it's all feasible. OK, so everything's there. Uh, it's ensuring that you buy buy in at the most senior level and the right skills in place to define that strategy and really take the whole thing forward and then ensure obviously the implementations go well beyond that. Thank you. Russell, what do we need to be cautious of with the multi-cloud approach, do you think? 
I think, well, I mean, I think Rhiannon sort of touched on some of those there. Um, I mean, security from, from, the, from the point of view that your attack surface area increases if you have multiple clouds. Um, and, and that's true whether they're public or private clouds, hybrid cloud. Um, the more platforms you have, the more things you need to keep an eye on in terms of potential security risk. Um, we referred to cost earlier. Alex talked about cost as well. Um, I think you know having your eye on the ball in terms of you know where is the right place to put those workloads, um, and as Alex says, sometimes yeah you know that is not the cloud, um, and I think that's all about you know right workload in the right place for the right reasons, um, and in very many cases you know if you have large quantities of data that you're keeping for long periods of time, you may actually find that you know the hybrid approach works out better for you in terms of the cost of managing that storage over that long period of time. Whereas, the you know the cloud will give you some other economic benefits by using cloud native services instead of VMs, for example. So you've got to take it all in the round. And I think um, you know having capabilities that allow you to manage your IT cross-platform, have visibility of what's going on. So you're not dependent on just one vendor set of tools, but you've actually got a kind of oversight of where, where are my workloads running? How much are they costing me? What's my security posture? Um, what technologies do we want to use and not want to use? Um, uh, and just being very kind of circumspect about that, I think, is is the key. Rhiannon, do you want to add to that? Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, when it comes to, I just want to mention costs. I think the the cost cutting is is a big part of what cloud, using the cloud can do for you. Um, and um, and there's lots of ways to automate how you to, to understand how much you're spending. Um, as I think you mentioned at the beginning about the home office cutting their um, spend by forty percent. A lot of that was done through just turning stuff off. They realised that things like because some, sometimes things can be turned off. And, you know, if you're not using your electricity, then the way you, you know, the way you save money is to turn off the lights. Well, that's what you do. This, you do exactly the same thing. You don't keep storing information you don't need to store, just turn it off. Um, there are lots and lots of ways to do that. But one of the key things that we tried to get across to departments was you have to work cross-functionally. So this is not a technology issue, just a technology issue. You need to work with your commercial teams and you need to work with your security teams and your, and your people teams to make sure that you've got, uh, that, that the tech solutions are being uh, covered and, and the, the um, tech outcomes you want, you're getting, but you're getting them at the right price. Um, and sometimes those things don't always match up very well. Um, the other thing I also just wanted to mention around, um, you know, the the benefits of cloud, not necessarily multi-cloud, but cloud generally, is that um, the the speed at which you can get things done and that you can um, you can get services up and running. Um, throughout COVID, right at the beginning of COVID, the services that were created for citizens would never have been created as quickly as they were had cloud not been an option. Um, so all, all the sort of um, vulnerable people services and things they were spun up in days um, I mean obviously they weren't completely done and the MVP was created within days and that would not have been possible without the cloud um, and so we see the benefits like so clearly um, from something like COVID um, and and a lot of people benefited from that and I think a lot of organizations realized how good uh, how good the cloud can be and how secure it can be how cost efficient etc. I think, I think um, if I, um, sorry Helen if I just sorry, have one that Thank you. Um, I think there's some really good points in there. I think the the, the risk of stretching Rhiannon's metaphor a little bit about the price of uh, keeping the lights on and so forth. I think back to my point that I made earlier in terms of the infrastructure components. You know, so much of cost. There's been all kinds of stats around this one. Let's say 70% is a bit of a benchmark. Um, IT costs can just go on this on maintaining. You know the, the steady state if you like keeping the lights on uh, was was the kind of the idea of the metaphor in there so you know anything that you can do in terms of turning things off or not necessarily turning them off completely but giving it an alternative in there where the cloud services can come in and go well you can actually have a much more controlled you know peak burst type of activity with cloud uh, turning it up turning it down and so forth the, there's, there's real benefits around that and that's where the, i think the cost component comes in the other point uh, just as an example uh, th this was actually not massively well publicized but i thought it was very interesting 
next story is Microsoft actually migrated the entire Ukrainian government from an on-premise situation to cloud-based services in a matter of, I think it was a month or two when the war started out there. And actually they did it for free as well, which was surprised me that it's yeah. not been, um, you know, uh, promoted a little bit more. The point around that was, of course, the Ukrainian government were an entirely on-premise IT in, environment, and suddenly they're, you know, uh, now entirely cloud-based, cloud -based, which in principle means it can operate from other, you know, locations as well. Wow, that's fascinating. Just going on from what Rhiannon was saying, Alex, you know, talking there about the pandemic, and we often talk at these events about opportunity that, you know, there were some opportunities that came out of a, a dreadful situation like the pandemic. Um, but I just wondered, you at the, at the Cloud Industry Forum, you do a lot of research, and I just wonder what kind of trends you, you've been seen emerging over the last 18 to 24 months, which perhaps may have been directly affected, you know, because we all went through a pandemic. Yeah, well, well, absolutely. And I think, you know, when, when you cast your mind back over the pandemic and we all talk about um, things being unprecedented in a very significant way, everything seems to be unprecedented these days, doesn't it? But um, it's very true. And, you know, that, that I think clearly caught uh, all of us by surprise and organisations had to react very rapidly. Um, and, you know, the benefits of cloud services, when we saw that all of a sudden Zoom becomes a household name, Teams becomes, you know, products that would be in our commercial world, everyday language, but suddenly, you know, my mum was starting to understand what it meant and things like this. So, 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 you know, the, I, I think people have understood what that can do for them, uh, what cloud services can do for them to, to a far greater extent. Um, I, you know, the, the other stuff when I, you know, think about our research components in there, uh, some of which I've already talked about uh, in terms of obviously the cost saving component, the, you know, the, the principles around transformation, the fact that organizations have really started to make a move, but it is much more of a familiar, a familiarity, if you like, to organizations now. They really understand the direction uh, that they're starting to go in, in the commercial sector. And I think that's now the next challenge in the public sector uh, to, 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 you know, really um, build on that. But, you know, I emphasize the point. Um, uh, around complexity as well. And I think one of the big issues that organizations will face is one of account accountability and responsibility. So who do I turn to? Because it can be a lot, often a little bit of, you know, uh, the, 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 the challenge when you, I don't know, you buy a bit of hardware and so on. Is it a hardware issue? Is it a software issue? Whatever it might be, who's responsible? Who's accountable? And I think that's got to be locked down right at the early stages of any kind of contractual uh, engagement that organizations have. Russell, I watched the mm. trailer for your Consciously Hybrid documentary um, the other day, actually, which was just reminding me that 50% of the UK's public sector budget is being spent on maintaining legacy tech. Mm -hmm. How does then, I know we've, we have touched on it a bit, but any more insight in, in how that transition from legacy to cloud can be made to, to bring in, you know, some, some hopefully some big savings? Yeah, I think, you know, as we said earlier, that that's the product of many decades of, of outsourcing agreements. And I think, you know, one of the really positive things about the work that was done in GDS and, and, and digital government is that it has encouraged departments to take more control over the development of their digital services. Um, and that means that now they can start turning their attention to how are we going to modernize these legacy systems that previously were completely outsourced and basically we didn't, didn't really understand them. And I think, you know, DWP have been doing a great job of this recently. They've started to insource support for a lot of those older systems. They're modernizing them. Um, and actually, you know, they're, they're, they're one of our customers and, and they're using our technology to help them to modernize the on-premise components or the, or the crown hosting hosted components um, that they use within their, their hybrid landscape. Um, so I think, you know, that's really important. I, I think when, when people talk to me about this, it doesn't come down to the technology, it comes down to operating model. Um, so one of the reasons we made the Consciously Hybrid film was because a lot of departments have kind of found themselves in this unconsciously hybrid state where they they kind of got there by accident. They're, they're sort of hybrid by default. Um, so you're trying to develop new digital services in the cloud. And so that's all agile. Um, you know, Alex hasn't said agility, scalability, flexibility yet. So, you know. Um, <laughs> I usually do, but, don't I, Russell? Yeah. <laughs> that's, so that's, that's all about that. But, but they're still stuck with this very traditional, you know, very kind of waterfall, um, you know, things take time, things are expensive kind of model for the rest of it. Um, and I think something that we at HPE are, are encouraging our customers to do is actually to think about bringing some of those more kind of agile, cloudy concepts to to the entire IT landscape. And, 
you know, so we developed something called the Edge to Cloud Adoption Framework, um, which looks at organizational maturity. It's a sort of capability maturity model um, across the organization. So about people, about strategy, about cost management, um, about operations, and, and really trying to kind of upskill the organization to think about how can we modernize the entire IT landscape rather than having these two very distinct, almost kind of polar opposite um, operating models, which are you know not complementary at all. Um, and so I think we've really got to sort of change our attitudes now. Um, the technology exists today. We can bring some of those cloud services and some of those some of that agility and flexibility to all environments. And I think that's really important. So rather than focusing on let's move everything to public cloud there are other types of cloud that we can adopt and there are other ways of getting there. And I think if we focus on modernization, we'll have a much better chance of getting to the citizen focused outcomes that we want, um, rather than just focusing on moving the place where the computer is done. And that's key, isn't it? The citizen focused outcomes that we all want. It always amazes me how quickly the cloud half hour flies by <laughs> and that we're, we're up to time already. So uh, massive thanks to uh, the three of you for being on our first panel of the afternoon. Um, thank you to Russell, to Rhiannon, and also to Alex. We Excellent. have covered a lot so far. So uh, let's take a break to digest what we've learned. It's our final break of the day. So it's your last chance to engage with all that the platform has to offer, whether this be our digital marketplace or the networking capabilities. Let's reconvene at 10 past three. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's nice to chat to you. Thank you.